So cricket is one of the biggest sports globally. It actually is one of the fastest growing sports for fantasy sports. Um, even though here in the U.S. we like to think a U.S. centric type of sports. Um, so it's going to be great to have uh, Abhishek Kinney, Dr. Kinney, uh, moderate this next session because cricket injuries for foot and ankle kind of apply around the globe. Um, so we're really excited to hear what you have to say and, and moderate this session with your great faculty. Thanks, Abhishek. Yeah, thanks, Celine, for having us here. And I think it gives me great pleasure to have uh, my mentors, Dr. James Calder, Dr. Junsha Padewala, Dr. Pim Pricker, and my dear friend, Dr. Rajesh Simon, as part of this session, where we'll be covering cricket injuries. And to start it without losing much time, I'll invite uh, Mr. Calder to take over this, uh, to share his slide and talk about, about lateral ligament injuries in professional cricketers. He treats a lot of cricketers at England Cricket Board and the Board of Control for Cricket in India. Um, James, please take over. Please share your slides. Thank you very much indeed, Abhishek. It's a real privilege to be able to join you guys. <clears throat> and uh, certainly cricket, I'm glad to see. It's, it's an odd one having cricket on an American platform here. Um, I, I went to school in Canada for a bit and I played a bit of cricket in Canada, but certainly never played it in the US. But uh, it's certainly a, it's certainly a worldwide sport, which the rest of the world is teaching England how to play cricket because we keep on getting beaten fairly successfully at the moment. Now, if I just share this with you. So um, <clears throat> really, it's, it, it, this transposes to cricket, but also to all, all sports. But I guess in cricket, there is a lot of cutting and turning. Some of the highest forces uh, during, uh, say, uh, the, uh, the left foot of a right-armed fast bowler, the forces going through the ankle are pretty huge. So what are the factors that need to be considered in this situation? Well, first of all, is any surgery necessary? What type of repair is, is, is best? And it's got to be reproducible, both in terms of surgery, uh, so you can do it again and again, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of results. And finally, we've got to have low risks. It's got to be a pretty easy thing to do. So why is ankle instability in, it's so important? We haven't actually got very good figures on the occurrence of uh, ankle injuries and ankle instability in cricket. But if we look at, say, the, the UEFA for the football, UEFA database, now we haven't got the 2021 figures, obviously, yet, but we're working on that. But you can see that an ankle ligament injuries have a huge burden on the time missed uh, from, from sport. And if you then confirm, sort of convert that into money, well, okay, you've got Neymar is being paid about a, um, half a million euros a, a week. Uh, and take it to another extreme, you know, Kevin Durant, he's on uh, $70 million a year before his, uh, that's just for his, uh, his uh, salary. So you lose a few days from him and it's not just his salary, but obviously it's the matches and then whether or not they can then make the playoffs in say the Brooklyn Nets at the moment. So it is also a common injury. We know it's a common injury, <clears throat> but also uh, it, it, it's in, in football, it's been shown just in the English football league that it's 11% of injuries and uh, 2000 games missed in just two seasons. So what is the best treatment? If you look at the Cochrane review, Gina Kirchhoff, who's a good friend of mine, has done several Cochrane reviews in the past. And certainly the conclusion there was that this is functional treatment. Functional treatment is the best way forwards. However, it did acknowledge within that, that operative treatment leads to more, more stability and less likelihood, therefore, for recurrent injuries. So there's a difference here. We're dealing with the Cochrane Review, which is for the general public, perhaps. And then if we're looking at high-level, multi-directional athletes, we may be looking at something slightly different, where we may be operative treatment is, leads to more stability. So this is a question. We're not talking about anything else. We're talking about the elite athletes here. And please don't think that we're going to be having to repair every single uh, lateral ligament injury that comes through the office door. We're also talking about severe injuries. So fortunately, I haven't got some really good videos of, of, England, of, of England cricketers in particular, or Indian and Pakistani cricketers, but the football, yeah, there are. We're talking about severe injuries. We're not talking about your little tweak uh, and an ATFL sprain. And this is a, a, a player who came in and he said, this was many, many years ago when he said, I, you, I know you don't repair these, James, but this ankle don't feel right. He said, this just doesn't feel right. And I really want you to consider repairing it because it's, it just feels unstable. And then he did his own anterior draw uh, in, the office, uh, in the office on the floor there. <clears throat> 
Now we know that uh, Pingeberg, 22 years ago, suggested that operative repair is the best option. Now at that stage, I have to say, I disagreed with them. That paper, I didn't, I didn't think that we need to uh, repair them all. And I think when uh, uh, when Abhishek was with me, I probably was very reluctant to consider operative repair at the, uh, in, the, in the acute stage. And we know that the instance of instability in some players is 10 to 20%. So it's very difficult to get a guy back to playing top level um, sports only at sort of the eight week stage, 12 week stage to fail the rehabilitation and then undergo a surgery, which may take another nine, 10 weeks to recover from. So you may be turning a three month injury into a six month injury. Furthermore, we know that residual instability is a predictor of repeated ankle sprains. And 34, so a third of sprains will reoccur within three years. Some of these are very old papers, but they still hold true today. And if we look at the UEFA database, 9% re-injury rate in the same season. So it's a significant problem and a significant worry that you're going to get these guys going back and then having another injury. So when we look at cricket, the forces, this is an Indian cricketer, slow motion video, fast bowler, the force is going through his ankle and the, any instability and ant any anterotranslational, rotational translation, it's unsurprising that you can then get later changes both in the chondral surface, osteophytes, perineal tendon injuries and things like this. So it's unsurprising that they will have a problem later on because purely because of the forces going through that, that ankle. Now we know that there are different types of instabilities because of different ligament injuries. And initially, Pal Galano was, was a wonderful anatomist at Bar in Barcelona, a very good friend who unfortunately died. He wrote some wonderful articles about the anatomy. But this has now been superseded with his, one of his protégés, uh, Mickey, who is also a good friend and a, and a student of, of uh, Powell's, who's looked at the new description of the lateral ligament anatomy, which initi was initiated by Powell. And it's actually not just, a, a, just an ATFL, but it is a, uh, the superior and inferior bundles, uh, fascicles, which are then joined to the, uh, to the CFL. So if you then pull on the superior fascicle, you may get a little bit of instability and some subtle instability there, but you may not get gross instability. And this is what um, Jordi Vega dis described as micro instability, some subtle, subtle problems there. Whereas if you have the inferior fascicle or both fascicles are injured, that's when you can see it's attached to the CFL. If that comes off, that may be when you start getting the gross instability because the CFL is, is, is damaged. And that's when you get the anterior draw, such as in this case, with a, what I say to suggest is the sulca sign. It's when you, if you suck the cheeks in, of your, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you, you're sucking in your cheeks, then that you get that feeling. And you see that exactly the same in a very unstable ankle. It sucks in and you get the sulcus sign. Yeah. So, sorry about the sound of this one. You can use fluoroscopy. I tend not to. Uh, I don't find it particularly useful. I use clinical examination and I don't find the the, uh, the fluoroscopy terribly helpful, but if you're unsure, you can use it. So why consider early surgery? Well, we know that 20 to 40% may have continuing pain. We also know that the intra-articular pathology is not, uh, is not uncommon, both in terms of cartilage damage uh, and uh, osteophytes, but also there's other things such as perineal tendon injuries, perineal tears we know are quite common during the repair, uh, when we see them dur during repair, whether or not they're pathological is, is, is open to vote for debate. I'm very happy to discuss that later on. And I wouldn't necessarily repair a perineal tendon split if it's, if it, because they've often been there for some time. So further things, why do we consider open surgery? Is there any su suggestion, consensus? Well, back in the consensus meeting in Warsaw, this was uh, in a, 11 years ago now, uh, the uh, a AOFAS, or sorry, the a AFAS, consensus meeting with the ankle instability group suggested that anatomical reconstruction should be considered. So we shouldn't be doing the, 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 the old Evans te techniques and things like this and going for ha hamstring grafts and things like this straight away. We should use anatomical repair. And it should also, early repair should be considered in elite athletes because there is an indication. There's always a worry that you're going to, whether it's going to take longer to get over after an operation to get, a, get over the recovery. Well, if we look at the, this, however, if you do operative recovery, you can actually, the multi-directional training can start uh, the, a little bit earlier, and actually, you can actually then bring them back a little bit earlier. And what we've found is we've actually probably now looking at about nine-week return to play 
after a double ligament injury where they've ruptured the ATFL, CFL uh, completely and they've got gross instability and you repair it because literally you are just tacking it back on again. So that's the pontification of, you know, that's me pont uh, pontifying. Well, can't get my words out. That's me sort of saying, this is what I think. But what about the results? Well, we know that good results are obtained with a brostrum repair in the long term. 90% good or excellent results in 26 years. Not in athletes, I give you that. But there are some concerns about infection risk and stiffness. But I think realistically, a low, that's, they're, they're low in, um, in those patients because it's a, it's, a, it's a small, it's a mini incision. It's not a big operation. And are we doing an anatomical repair? Well, I think we are. I think this is just what Mickey has been talking about uh, in his papers. We are bringing the ATFL back up onto its place. And that in itself brings up the, the CFL, which is probably why you don't need to do a separate repair for the CFL, which is why young Carlson during his uh, uh, thesis, must have been nearly 40 years ago, he was saying an ATFL repair is, is, is essentially the best way to go. And now I think Mickey has proven why that's the case, because it's actually bringing up the CFL into the right place. Do I use the Gould modification? Well, no, I don't think it's necessary because I think that, that you can try and bring it up, but it's a pretty fragile uh, retinaculum. And there is the nerve right next door as well. And there's some uh, paper once again by Mickey showing that probably it's probably not necessary. It's pretty, it's, it's not always there either. So I tend not to use it because I do this anatomical re uh, reconstruction. Arthroscopic repairs, there are many reports. It's a great technique. I have no problem with it. Takio, uh, Professor Takio in, in Japan has talked about it, Stefan Gilo in France. And I use it in some patients, but not in the, uh, in the, in the elite athlete. We know that it's, it's, it seems to have good results, but as far as I'm concerned, there's no, uh, result, there are no results in the elite level athletes. And you've got one chance of getting these guys right and ladies right. And so I use an, a mini open incision because I know it works. Maybe in the future, uh, arthroscopic repairs will be the way forwards. But at the moment, I'm not sure that's the way forwards. And that is, report, that is backed up by some, um, by some recent journal. It's in print. It's just been published, actually, by Chad. Uh, and I was involved in the, in the systematic review with Mark Glazebrook in, in Canada. And it does suggest that uh, open anatomical repair is the way forward and is the, the gold standard at the moment. So does this happen? Well, White, James White, looked at 33 professional athletes and found very, very good results um, uh, in, in these patients. So these were all professional athletes. They were um, uh, from various different uh, elite sports, but top level in the, in the UK. Um, and if we look at the results at two years, all were stable. Um, two had a superficial infection requiring, uh, uh, requiring a few days of antibiotics, but they returned to, to play and training in an appropriate time. So return to play in 72 days with an isolated injury, so 10 weeks. We're now down a little bit less than that. We, this, is, this is now six years ago. We're down to about nine weeks probably for return to play. Some get bit, bit, a bit quicker. So in summary, I'd say that an open brostrum, possibly gold, not sure about that, but certainly the open brostrum has a predictably high success rate. And I think there's an unproven advantage at the moment with arthroscopic techniques, although that may change in the future. For acute ruptures, I think there is an, there is an argument to suggest a selective approach to repairing these, uh, in acute, uh, these acute injuries in young uh, elite athletes. I think it does enable a return to play within 10 weeks. Uh, it's the same rehab and weight bearing as arthroscopic repair. So just get on. I think that the, the open repair is best at the moment. And I genuinely think it reduces the risk of longer term problems. And I'm not talking about prevention of arthritis and things. I can't prove that, but I think the return to play, and it does seem to reduce the, uh, the risk of re-injury. Um, so that's where, where I am on this. And I think we need to acknowledge the fact that, you know, athletes are different. Their expectations are different. Their pressures are different. And therefore, they deserve different treatment. And it's not for the normal people for the normal wannabe athlete, but I think these are, I'm talking about elite athletes only. They're expensive and they need something else. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, James. Thank you very much. Um, any uh, questions that we should take right now? Uh, Celine, uh, welcome Dinshaw sir for having us uh, join. I think Dinshaw is one of the more uh, eminent faculty for cricketers in India and all other sportsmen. No questions yet, so keep going. 
Okay. Uh, maybe one question like, uh, James, do you consider looking at the MRIs, like how the quality of the tissue is, whether it's a mid substance or whether it has come out from the fibula end or from the tailor end while doing your repair? And uh, you mentioned that acute repair is the only way, but especially considering hyperlax individuals, like what you see from the South Asian uh, continent. Uh, do you consider doing a reconstruction using a gracilis or a plantaris as a primary repair, or you would always keep that as a secondary failure case? That's that's really that's really good, and it's quite, it's really difficult questions. I think yes, I do use the MRI scan to look at exactly what's going on. Those the sleeve avulsions when they've sort of come away from the the fibula, uh, they're easy because you just literally tack them back on again, put a suture anchor into the, into the fibula and reattach it. And you know that you're going to get a, a really good result there. So I think they're very good. Also for planning for where you're going to put the incision, I use a little mini incision. If and those, those are, <coughs> excuse me, those are, they're unusual, but if you've got an avulsion of the ATFL from the attachment onto the talus, you may have put your incision a little bit too far up on the fibula. So I think it is important to look carefully at the MRI scan. We do have a study going on at the moment, which we're just about to publish, looking at whether you can identify the fascicles, uh, the different fascicles in the MRI scan. And you can, uh, you just do a slightly different cut. So we're now doing those as routine cuts. Because if you've got a single fascicle injury, you probably haven't, don't need to repair it. That's my, uh, perhaps we're having, a, we're having a look at that. I can't prove that yet. Whereas if you've got a double fascicle injury uh, coming from there, then those are the ones that you think, actually, you're probably better off having that um, uh, repaired. So yes, MRI scan, I think is important. I think it will play a, 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 a future role in differentiating which ones require repair. When it comes to the laxity, now, yeah, absolutely. This is, it, it is interesting. Uh, the, 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 but if we look at the results of the brostrum in ballet dancers, which is another group that I look after, if we look at those group, actually they they do very well with a primary with a, a brostrum repair and a brostrum gourd re reconstruction because it gives them they're an impossible <laughs> they're impossible creatures to treat because they want ultimate stability but complete mobility so they you know they need the the, the, the unicorn operation and I, I think that you know they and yet it works so the brostrum I think does work in that and it may be because you're getting a little bit more uh, stiffness because of the scar tissue that's formed uh, in there, although I think the recurrence rate, I think you're right, the recurrence rate is is slightly higher. But I wouldn't look to do anything but an anatomical reconstruction in the acute setting. Yes, I do occasionally use a gracilis graft in those patients who have uh, re-injured, re and I have used something, so augmentation such as an internal brace in those patients where there is poor quality. If you get in there and they've had really bad stretched up ligaments and you look at it, <clears throat> And you, and, you, and you assess the, 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 the tissues and you go, this isn't going to work, then yes, I would probably use an internal brace because I think you can use that uh, to, to help stability and help the, the initial thing, but I don't use it routinely. Great. Thank you. I agree. I think I've learned this from you for the last 10 years. I think uh, Dr. Simon had raised his hands. Any questions, Dr. Simon? No, he did answer it about the internal brace because that is something which always I find in a hypermobile thing, whether you need an internal brace. He's answered it in the last sentence. So that's it. Okay. Hey, one quick question that's come up, Abhishek. Um, yes. Should the CFL be repaired simultaneously to the ATFL? That's one question. And then how do you deal with an isolated CFL that's evolved off the calcaneus? Um, the first thing I think I would address by looking at uh, Mickey's work, Mickey Dalma Pasta's work in that, I think that if you bring up the ATFL foot onto its footprint, normally you're bringing up also the CFL because of those arsiform ligaments that the arsiform uh, uh, connection between the ATFL and CFL. So normally it comes up in one, which is why I tend to do an ATFL repair. The CFL, that's interesting. And I have had a few of those when it's been avulsed and you can see it's pulled off and there's a little bit of bone edema on the, on the, on the ars calcius. And in those cases, I will actually go down and just track down under the um, perineal tendons. You make a, It's not a mini incision by any means. You just track down under those perineal tendons. And I will, in those cases, stick an anchor into the oscalsis and then reattach the CFL down on there. I don't think there's a lot of 
I don't think there's any evidence that that works actually, as far as I'm aware, but I quite agree for those very unusual cases, it does seem a pretty, uh, a pretty good thing to do or a good idea. Um, but I have got no evidence to support that statement at all, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you, James. I think uh, we'll go to our next speaker. Uh, welcome, Dinsha sir. Uh, Dinsha sir is uh, Director of Sports Medicine at uh, Kokila Benambani Hospital in Bombay. Dinsha sir, all over to you. Thank you, Abhishek. Okay, so I'm going to cover posterior ankle impingement in fast bowlers. And uh, as James just mentioned, cricketers and fast bowlers especially are a different population altogether that need to be considered as, as a special sports population. So posterior ankle impingement, it results from recurrent trauma to the posterior ankle capsular ligamentous complex, the flexor hallucis longus tendon, and or uh, ostrigonum. It can be either soft tissue impingement or bony impingement. And fast bowlers, especially on their front foot, are particularly prone for this injury. In this short lecture, I'm going to cover the relevant anatomy, the etiology and the pathogenesis, the clinical presentation and diagnosis, the non-operative treatment, the surgical treatment, and the outcomes for treatment with posterior ankle impingement. What's important to note in the clinical anatomy is that the posterior ankle region consists of not just bony, but also soft tissue structures. And these are positioned posterior to the tibiotalar joint, the subtalar joint, and the calcaneus. As far as the posterior talar process is considered, this is basically the area behind the articular part of the talus. And it consists of two projections, the posteromedial process and the posterolateral process. So that's the posteromedial and that's the posterolateral. The posterolateral process is referred to as the trigonal process, and this is the one that's most commonly implicated in posterior ankle impingement. Now, when the trigonal process remains as a non-fused entity from the Taylor body, this is really the os trigonum. Now, the os trigonum develops as a secondary ossification center and later undergoes fusion with the Taylor body. Now, this happens in early adolescence. When mineralization and fusion are complete, if there's an elongated postulatal process, we call that the Stydas process. And if it's an os trigonum, then this basically represents a failure of the secondary ossification center to undergo fusion. Now, it's important to note that this failure may be a radiological one. And the incidence of os trigonum you could see it in anywhere from 1.7 to 49% of the population. But uh, many of these really are going to be asymptomatic. So just having an os trigonum there doesn't mean that that patient is having his symptoms primarily because of that os. We also need to note that the flexor hallucis longus tendon, the FHL, courses in between the medial and the lateral facet. So that's the medial facet there, that's the lateral facet. And that's the area where it's going to course. Distally, the tendon sheath forms a fibrooseous tunnel. So this is that fibrooseous tunnel that's attached to the posterior talus. And so patients with soft tissue impingement, this is the area that you're looking for. As far as the etiology and the pathogenesis, well, you can see that when a fast bowler lands on his front foot, that front foot often goes into an extreme amount of forced plantar flexion. And so that front foot contact, uh, contact, when he goes into that front foot and he lands up with that forced plantar flexion, and this happens again and again and again, there's a nutcracker sort of effect taking place at the posterior aspect of the ankle. And this nutcracker effect may not necessarily result in just bony problems. It may also result in soft tissue problems. So, FHL tendonitis or tenosynovitis, this usually re results because of compression of the tendon within the sheath itself. And this entrapment could either be just because of repetitive overuse or an aberrant or a low-lying FHL muscle belly. This could also happen because of friction between an unstable os and the tendon. And then this results in synovitis, this results in synovial hypertrophy, and then often this fibrooseous tunnel is going to get inflamed 
and then re this results then in soft tissue impingement. On the other hand, you could get an os trigonum syndrome where basically it's an unstable os that's causing all of those issues. It could be an acute fracture of the slider process, or it could be a stable os where that fibrocartilage has now become unstable and therefore it's become an unstable os, or it could be just a fibrous uh, uh, disconnection and a complete loss of continuity of that os. So all of these could result in an os trigonum or a destabilization of that os, and then this results in bony impingement. Most patients with an os trigonum syndrome will be those who have an acute onset. So they will remember that they had a sudden forceful plantar flexion, and then most of their symptoms resulted because of that. Now, in clinical presentation, we typically see two types of patients. We see those who are acute and those which come in with a chronic repetitive process. In the acute ones, we, critically, uh, we will often see that it's an elongated cider process that's been compressed between the posterior malleus of the calcaneum, causing a fracture or an injury to the synchondrosis. So it's an unstable os that's because of a single injury taking place. However, in a chronic scenario, we will see that this is basically because of repetitive plantar flexion. And here, you're going to see not just clinical signs of, uh, uh, of chronicity to the soft tissues, but also patients who come to you with uh, uh, many months of uh, 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 pain with that landing that they sustain. Now, diagnosis. Diagnosis is both a clinical and a radiological diagnosis. And clinically, because this is a deep structure, it's not always possible to get a perfect uh, pathoanatomical diagnosis just based on clinical evaluation. So, of course, when the patient tells you that he's getting posterior ankle pain, this could be because of many reasons. And when you can palpate that he's got tenderness there postulaterally, and when you do forced plantar flexion on his foot, a posterior impingement test, and then that recreates the pain, you can suspect that, yes, he's got posterior ankle impingement. But what's really causing that impingement? Is it soft tissue? Is it bony? That often is a radiological diagnosis. And radiologically, the first thing you're going to see is on an X-ray, you'll see that, that there's an os there. Now, you could get a CT scan, and again, on that CT scan, if you see that you've got a displaced os, then that would probably tell you that that's the cause of pain. But often that's not going to be seen on a CT, and it's going to be an MRI, which would be helpful. Sometimes the CT is useful because on the X-ray itself, you may not really note that there's an os. You may, it may look just like an elongated uh, posterior process, a slider process, but it's a CT scan that shows you the acute fracture there in that posterior uh, facet. An MRI, I find, is most useful because in an MRI, you can see the changes. And if you see bone edema there, you see changes of edema around the synchondrosis, then you know that that's probably an unstable ostrigonum, and that's probably the cause of uh, his pain. An MRI also shows you other features if you've got features suggestive of FHL tendinitis or tenosynovitis, if you've got bone edema there around the os, then again, that gives you a fair idea that this is a combined soft tissue and a bony posterior impingement. In some instances, you may require either a bone scan, which can be diagnostic, or you may require an injection as a diagnostic test to let you know whether it's bone or soft tissue. As far as the non-operative treatment goes, I think for most of our athletes, uh, unless they've got an unstable acute fracture of that uh, process, we would initially start off with non-surgical treatment. And that basically involves rest, activity modification, ice elevation, NSAID medication, and protected weight bearing initially. And in case the patient has an acute fracture then we would uh, immobilize them, but otherwise we don't immobilize them uh, for any significant period. Uh, physical therapy also can provide significant benefits uh, by diminishing the inflammatory process, and this is uh, sometimes shockwave or ultrasound, some amount of massage and stretching to regain uh, range of motion. Often in the chronic patients, they're going to land up with an uh, inflammatory process that causes a scarring and fibrosis and a loss of range, so physiotherapy will regain their range 
uh, uh, if there's a slow, gradual uh, stretch. Unfortunately, non-surgical treatment is successful in only about 60% of patients. And, uh, and therefore, if a patient has failed a non-surgical treatment or comes with recurrence, then often there are indications for operative treatment. Ultrasound-guided injections uh, uh, are useful, I think, primarily for diagnostic reasons initially, where we use just a local anesthetic. And if you place this just in the soft tissues or just in the FHL sheet, then you could get a fair idea of whether that's the cause of pain or not. Uh, uh, placing an injection near the synchondrosis and the os can also help you. If the pain goes away, then you know that that's probably the unstable os that's causing pain. Uh, typically, for patients who are in the middle of their season, uh, who are not that symptomatic, we would give them a corticosteroid injection. And corticosteroid injections have shown about 84% of improvement in patients. But typically, they will come back with recurrence, and they do have the risk of causing uh, tendon uh, ruptures in the long run. So I think you need to be a little careful with these injections. As far as PRP injections are concerned, we know that PRP injections have been used uh, in tendonitis with a fair amount of success, but there's no real published study with uh, FHL tendonitis and PRP. I'm not too sure that that's uh, the, the treatment process that I would use for any of our competitive athletes. So if you've got a fracture like this, I think, and it's an acute fracture, then I think an immobilization would be useful if you've got just uh, inflammatory signs like this, uh, no real changes, bony changes, uh, and the local injection here with anesthetic has helped in pain relief, and I think giving uh, corticosteroid is at least going to help in these specific instances. Now, surgical treatment, uh, any patient who's failed non-operative treatment, any patient who comes with a second recurrence, especially if he's off-season, it's best to go ahead and do your surgical process there itself. And this is one such 23-year-old fast bowler with a, a chronic posterior ankle impingement uh, and pain who's had two prior injections there. So what do you do? You do a posterior ankle, a hind foot endoscopic uh, excision of this, and you're going to use typically two portals, the posterolateral and the posteromedial. And as soon as you go in, you're going to note that that's the FHL tendon there. Sometimes you'll find that there's a lot of scarring around that tendon. There may be an inflamed tendon there may be an inflamed uh, FHL sheath too. Uh, first thing I like to do is in, ensure that you're visualizing both the subtalar joint and the ankle joint. And then typically I'll put a probe in and demonstrate the instability of that os. And if you look at it from the subtalar portion, you'll often note the area of the synchondrosis. And that's your unstable os there. You just need to put in a small osteotome release it from that os area, and then take that fragment out. Often you will need to check that there's no residual impingement on the FHL tendon, and you may need to take and burr off a little more of that posterior uh, tailor process after that. Typically, these fragments are about a centimeter in size, so that's the fragment that's been removed. And once you've done that, make sure that your FHL is nice and free. You've not got any residual uh, uh, impingement. And sometimes I also need to go ahead and burr a little more than just the synchondrosis to ensure that there's no residual posterior uh, uh, ankle impingement. Uh, this is one interesting case. Sometimes you'll find additional pathology there too. So this is a 27-year-old uh, fast bowler. He's had pain in the left ankle since the last six months. It started off with an insidious onset. And that pain is not just in the posterior ankle. But uh, and that pain uh, during his front foot landing. He's also got deep ankle pain while running. He's got a forced plantar flexion impingement test, which is positive. Uh, and on the x-ray, we can see that he's also got a medial Taylor uh, OLT. Now, he's been pain-free for three months with a posterior ankle steroid injection, but he's come back again with pain. And on the MRI, you'll note that he's got an unstable os out there. He's got features suggestive of soft tissue impingement too. And at the same time, he's got a medial Taylor OCD or OLT. Now, in this situation too, you can approach this with a hind foot endoscopy and uh, take care of 
all three pathological processes with the hind foot endoscopy. So that's the, we're visualizing it from the hind foot. So that's the os there. It's totally unstable. That synchondrosis itself is broken. That's the FHL there. So the first thing that you do is go ahead and release all of the soft tissue attachments to this, including the attachment of the PTFL. And typically I do this with a radio frequency. You could do this with a shaver or with the arthroscopic scissors too. Once you've got that unstable fragment released, So you're taking out all of the last parts of the adhesion there. So once you've taken out that fragment and you've released it, then any other loose fragments and are taken off. So any residual bony fragments there like this one needs to come off. So you dilate the portal. And once you've dilated the portal, then that comes out. Again, you can see that there's a little piece there. So you want to get all of the other fragments. Anything that's causing impingement is out. Stabilize the soft tissues posteriorly, including the intermalleolar ligament. If there's any FHL pathology, then you take care of it at this stage. And then once you've done that, you can approach the posterior aspect of the tibio joint and this uh, unstable fragment needs to come off. And in him, all I did was get that fragment out, stabilize the margins, and then do a uh, bone marrow stimulation there. And that fast bowler uh, returned back at about uh, seven months uh, back to bowling. Okay, so outcomes. Well, if we look at literature and the outcomes, if we look at just an os trigonum syndrome, then conservative therapy success rates in literature between 60 to 84 percent. Corticosteroid injections anywhere from 29 to 100 percent. But do remember that injections of corticosteroid do risk tendon rupture. Open excision of the os trigonum is also possible, and you could do this uh, both with a posteromedial or a posterolateral approach. Both have been described. And the success rate, well, uh, in one series, you've had good to excellent results in 88% of patients. Uh, it seems to be that the norm today is an endoscopic excision of the os trigonum, where the success rates are up to 93% return to pre-injury athletic levels. And uh, uh, this is in one reported series of 16 patients uh, evaluated at a mean follow-up of 32 months. And the re uh, return to sports has been anywhere between six weeks to uh, six months. Now, there's only one uh, a study by Akshay Mansingh from West Indies on uh, posterior ankle impingement in fast bowlers specifically. But if you have to take uh, all other sports which are similar, then uh, these are the sort of uh, reported results. As far as FHL, stenosing, tenosynovitis, conservative therapy success rates between 46 to 64% at one year, but a high reported rate of recurrence uh, with conservative therapy when you're looking at soft tissue impingement. And surgical intervention recommended for patients who had inadequate relief of, with conservative treatment or recurrence. And this would involve debridement of the tendon along with release of the retinaculum release of the fibrous tunnel, and sometimes even uh, repair of the FHL tendon. Patient satisfaction rates between 85 to 90% with open surgery and 80% with uh, endoscopic surgery. And um, uh, in one uh, series of patients, full activity and return to sports was as good as 100%. It would appear that return to sports activity has been shorter with the endoscopic approach, four to six weeks, as compared to open surgery, which is about 12 to 25 weeks. And I suspect that's the reason why most uh, foot and ankle surgeons are slowly moving towards uh, endoscopic uh, uh, posterior ankle surgery. So in conclusion, 
Osteo ankle impingement results from recurrent trauma to the posterior ankle capsule ligamentous complex, the FHL tendon, and or the ostrigonum. This is common in front foot uh, in the front foot of fast bowlers due to the nutcracker effect and repetitive dynamic push off maneuvers. Uh, clinical diagnosis is sometimes difficult, and therefore you would require an MRI, and you may require differential injections also to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, Non-surgical treatment is valid, especially if the patient's in the middle of his season and uh, uh, does give you short-term results for sure, but um, some patients will come back to, with recurrence or inadequate uh, relief of their uh, pain. And for them, I think an endoscopic uh, technique results in a predictable and an early return to sports. Thank you. Thank you, Dinsha, sir. It's always, uh, I think we learn always just by listening to you. Uh, any questions, uh, Selim? Or uh, my one question is, in a low-lying FHL belly, which causes a posterior impingement, how high do you go and release it? Like, how much? Do you have any landmark, like 5 centimeters, 7 centimeters, or something like that? Uh, no, I think just about 3 or 4 centimeters is, for me, is good enough. I, I try and make sure that you know you've done enough of a release there posturally. Uh, sometimes seeing some amount of inflammatory changes within the tendon also gives you an idea of how high you need to go. And uh, typically at the end of the procedure, you need to make sure that you've got no residual impingement there. I think that becomes my sort of guide, Abhishek. Correct. Thank you. James, any questions for Dr. Padiwala or Selene, anyone in the chat box? Yeah, actually, we did get something, Dinshaw. Good to see you, by the way. Uh, how do you I deal see. with the patient of posterior ankle impingement without an ostrigonum? Yeah, so you could have just a patient with a soft tissue problem. So if you get that MRI done and you find that he's got no bony changes there at all, he's got no fracture, no ostrigonum, that posterior tail uh, process is normal, and you see that he's got tenosynovitis or tendinitis or features of soft tissue impingement, then typically I'm going to treat these patients with non-operative treatment initially. So everything that we just discussed, and, uh, if, and, and if it's an athlete who, who is significantly symptomatic and is in the middle of uh, a playing season and needs to continue with it, I would in fact think of an injection too. And that injection would be a corticosteroid within the sheath of the uh, FHL. Typically, these patients will get uh, good pain relief uh, when they don't have any bony changes. The problem is that if you don't correct the biomechanics, these patients are likely to come back uh, in the future with uh, recurrent symptoms. And if, they, if it's someone that has been coming back to me with recurrent symptoms, then these are the patients that I would consider an endoscopic surgery for. Yeah, James, your, your, your comments on it. Thanks. Great, great lecture. Really enjoyed it. You know, very, very thorough. And I just, I w just wondered how much do you think uh, instability is contributing to some posterior ankle impingement? Because in the ballet, we've been able to prevent them from having surgery by getting good stability and getting some stability back into it again. It's difficult in the fast bowler because of the forces just slamming in there. And do you have any thoughts about doing a lateral ligament reconstruction to help stabilize to improve uh, your results at the same time as saying taking an ostrigonum out okay so i think that's a really interesting uh, uh, you know situation there and i think that instability probably especially micro instability probably has some role with posterior ankle impingement too and uh, typically as part of our rehab when we're working on our rehab, our rehab also takes care of all of the instability factors. There will be the occasional patient who's got a frank lateral ankle instability and who tells you that, look, I've had multiple ankle sprains. And when you examine them, your, your clinical signs for lateral ankle instability are also positive. Now, those are the patients where we would add on a, a procedure for uh, uh, a brostrum for that patient in the, in the same stage. But I would say that that happens in only about 10 or 15% of my patients. Most patients come in with focal posterior pain. Uh, you've given them an injection, that pain's gone away. They typically will go back to bowling immediately because they don't want a surgery. They want to get back to sports immediately. 
they will come back when they have a recurrence and they will typically time it such that it's off season and uh, you know you'd go ahead and you do your surgery uh, most of these patients surprisingly in their rehab when you're working on uh, stabilizing uh, all of their stabilizing mechanisms typically a lot of them do well so i think that taking care of that acute structural problem there then helps them with their uh, stability too uh, of course ballet is of course so different from a fast bowler landing because of the forces there and um, uh, we do have patients who've undergone surgery and then who are okay for 3 years and 4 years who then come back with recurrent symptoms even post surgically so i think those are the patients we are really concerned because maybe they've got instability factors there that we haven't really managed to correct uh, completely that's really reassuring that you get those patients back sort of three or four years later, and I sit there paranoid, going, "What did I do wrong?" You know, it's not just me. <laughs> no, but I think uh, in ballet is more of a soft tissue impingement. I would say, like uh, maybe very rarely, but in fast bowlers, that os trigonum, I think, is a very different thing. But I think it's there are a lot of overlap between micro instability, bony impingement, soft tissue impingement. plus the subtalar joint having a rotational profile as compared to just the lateral i think too many factors and that's i think one more debate i think with falling short of time we'll push ahead thank you james thank you uh, in charge of uh, dr milin pimprikar is our next talk as an ex speaker will be talking on bone marrow edema syndromes in foot and ankle in cricketers then sir please share your talk Dr. Pimprika. Uh, till Dr. Pimprika comes in, uh, can we take the next speaker in, Rajesh sir, Simon? Yeah, I can. Uh, Dr. Madan is yeah. not there. So shall I share, share my screen? Yes, you can, and I'll talk to Dr. Pimprika in the meantime. So, am I visible? Yes, I think uh, presentation mode needs to be put on. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Abhishek, and thank you, Salim, for uh, this thing and the fabulous meeting going on. Listening to the good uh, events of sports injuries. So, my topic on today is the Achilles injuries in the cricketers, which is actually a very less common. compared to the other sports in cricket so achilles injury does happen in fact uh, mr the mat prior got had to retire early after the indian series when he injured his achilles and then had to go for surgery and then i think he had to force his retirement early so uh, com- uh, and uh, decreasing his uh, sports career but saying that it is a very less common injury compared to the other sports especially the the uh, badminton the soccer because of the less amount of pivoting type of injuries uh, the movements and uh, here we have more association with tendinopathies than complete tear and yes it happens it can devastate the uh, the 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 gear the person's career So the pattern of injury in Achilles is two thirds are usually the peritonitis, and few, the one fifth would be an insertional uh, problem, and it is more because of the painful overuse in jumping and running, and that we see again more commonly in the bowlers. So this was a paper by Larry White, and he said that. the major injury happened in the pre season in the cricketers now that is because after a layoff there was a higher incidence because of the lesser warming up and the, at that particular time it was 3.5 but once the competitive uh, season started it was one per week and that is something which we can relate to after this pandemic when we started suddenly seeing a lot of people coming in because they have been not been on the sports for some uh, problem so achilles injuries does happen and cricketers and more seen in the bowlers 
fielders and at times to the wicket keepers. The risk factor, as per the Khans et al., uh, his paper said the risk factor depend depends on the level of professionalism. Now, this professionalism comes from the good elite uh, uh, cricketers to the roadside cricketers, which we have plenty in India. And uh, the game time, again, as I said, the pre-season season was more problematic. And of course, the ground condition, if it is dry and hard, that would again lead to the stamping of the Achilles and stretching leading to the injury. If you look at the Dan Jones quadrants, uh, if you look at uh, that, the, 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 uh, the sport fitness, quadrant one uh, is the, the normal low level skills like we see in the school level uh, of exercises. Quadrant two is where the elite uh, players are. They have a lot of high level qualities and they're good for collision sports. But that is where most of the people think they are, other than, of course, the elite players. The quadrant three is the most people wherein they think they are in quadrant two and they go out for the sports and they injure the echelis. So that is what we have here, especially, as I said, post-pandemic, everybody thought they were very good. And we have a lot of IT sector people who go for this cricketing turf. And we also in India are unique, have a unique playground in the roadside, wherein uh, our elite players to the non-elite players have played here. And this is one turf where a lot of injuries are seen. So the risk factors for Achilles injuries could be intrinsic as well as the extrinsic. The intrinsic being the subtalar hyperpronations, the micro tears because of the non-athletic uh, type of, of workout, excessive uh, forefoot uh, and hind foot because of some kind of subtle deformities. Femoral antiversion can also create a risk factor. While, uh, while one of the common things in cricketers is the hamstring muscle uh, tightness and that also leads to Achilles tendon injury. The extrinsic factors would be, of course, the training techniques, the excessive uh, running and jumping and the pivoting uh, movements which they have at present, especially in the Indian um, allied group, we do see that. And of course, the previous injury is always a risk factor. Diagnosis, as we all know, is the sudden pain in the affected limb. Patients feels like they are stuck in the back of the leg and of course, there's an edema and bruising. And on examination, if it is a non-insertional or an insertional, depending upon that, you have the thickened and degenerated tendon or acute pain. In later stages, you will find this Achilles tendinosis with Hagelins. This are not for mostly elite uh, players. This are more for those weakened warriors, especially the 40s age group where they suddenly go and then they have this pain and they play, still play and end up having these problems. So the management always, as we have all seen from the other injuries also, is the start with prevention, good physical, uh, regular activity, warm up, which increases the circulation temperature and preventing the injury level. Eccentric plantar flexion strengthening is something which we all say to the physio and the rehab people to do it before they go into all sorts of uh, 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 the elite activities, and are, of course, so the drugs are also there. Conservative management is the treatment usually seen in the tendinopathy. They all want to go back, as uh, Dr. Dinshaw, uh, Dinshaw was saying about the FHL thing. They all want to go back immediately with the play, and uh, so the, the rehab process, orthotics, braces, heel lifts, they all help to a certain extent and uh, we can always prevent such things by rehabilitating them before. Only in the refractory phases, you need to do surgical intervention in the tendinopathy cases. The acute complete tear is again very uncommon in Achilles tendon, uh, in cricketers, but yes, it can happen and it is, uh, you can feel the difference like any other Achilles tendon injury, the gap and usually the patients will have a gap and the angle of dangle would be different. 
The Thomson test, as you all know, would be helpful. This is, sorry for the uh, voice. And ultrasound MRI is always helpful in diagnosing uh, the, 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 the soft tissue injury. The goal is to restore the muscular tenderness length, especially in the players. It is very important to optimize the gastrosolius strength and function. And of course, you don't want other complications. In Achilles tendon injury, in general population, there is this huge debate now between the conservative management and operative treatment. And you have a whole lot of meta-analysis coming from uh, early stages. And from 2012, more and more meta-analysis says this was the latest in 2021. And the more um, have come saying that conservative patients, conservative treatment are actually suitable and um, not surgical. Then is this applicable for an elite athlete or cricketer is something which we have to take as a crucial decision making as far as the surgeon as well as the, uh, the, the, the player is concerned because you want the patient to go back to uh, play as well as have no problems. But then you should- uh, Can we sum to... up yeah, one minute away? Can you please sum up? With it? Yeah, so functional rehab, uh, as well as uh, which is an ultrasound guided uh, rehab and uh, then the surgical uh, we can do a mini open repair and that is the almost similar rehab you have so written to the sports many a times is possible 75 percent days as per this paper but then 25 percent is a significant number who may not return to the sports so in summary prevention of this devastating problem is important Conservative management is the mainstay for the tendonitis. Operative for a light uh, sports person may be preferred. Possibility of devastating end should always be remembered. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Abhishek, thanks for moderating uh, a great session, giving uh, everybody insight into the cricket injuries, which we are underappreciating. Um, all of you guys, thanks for, for being part of this. Um, we will be back in a minute for the next session. Thank you.